I, I appreciate this opportunity to come and make a presentation to you all today. And the topic is uh, very near and dear to my heart because I think I've spent the last 20 years or so working in this arena. And uh, one of the questions that has come up over the course of my interaction at various workshops is how come none of the companies bring a product that has problems associated with it? And it, it occurred to me that there is a whole body of work that goes on that is not at all clear to the public. And that's basically what the point of this talk is, and then focusing specifically where compositional analysis fits. So um, a lot of what I'm going to be presenting in the introductory slide reiterates what Dr. Mum just presented. And we were aware of this duplication, but we decided that repetition is good for all of us. And uh, my pictures are going to be different, but nevertheless, some of the content hopefully correlates pretty much the same. So this is um, a stage plan. This is not Monsanto's. This happens to be BASF. But it looks very familiar, and we call them stages instead of phases. But nevertheless, it's the same concept. You start with the idea and the discovery phase. You work through, if you find a gene that imparts a trait that has some commercial interest, then you work at optimizing the expression, developing the trait, and finding the best event that is going to allow you to bring this to market. Um, I thought Dr. Mum did an excellent um, job at describing what an ideal event is. Um, the whole process can take a lot of years. And sadly, the last couple steps seem to be taking longer and longer than they used to. And this is because more and more data is being required by the different um, global regulatory agencies around the world. And each, each uh, country or region does their own safety assessment and have their own specific questions. So the statement that she made earlier that these are highly evaluated, I think, is extremely true. And they're evaluated by many, many different eyes everywhere. OK, so bringing a product to market. These are, this is what's involved in the first step prior to identifying the elite event. First of all, you have to have the idea. What, what is your concept? Where are you going to go with it? Is there somebody out there that might be interested in, in a product that, that you're interested in producing? Then you have to identify the gene that might actually convey this trait or produce this idea successfully in the crop of interest. Then you deliver it, as John Feiner discussed yesterday, to the cells that will eventually regenerate into a plant that needs to be fertile and will pass the trait on to the progeny in a stable and consistent manner. And that performs in the field, first in the greenhouse and then in the field. I would like to point out that we're not trying to convert some of these crops because I, I realize I mixed and matched some of my pictures here. We're not changing one organism to another organism. But we are going through various testings at different levels. OK, but does it work every time? No. Why not? Um, sometimes the idea is not a good idea. You might not be able to get corn to perform with that trait at all. It just might not be a good idea. Sometimes you have to cut and run there. Um, the trait can be too complex. The initial traits, herbicide tolerance and insect resistance, they were single gene. The concept was easy, straightforward. And uh, it took a long time. But eventually, scientists were successful at overcoming each one of the hurdles at each one of the steps. But it doesn't always work that way. Maybe too complex. Time might not be right. Getting uh, corn to fix nitrogen might be a good example. That is a complex trait. The idea is fantastic. I think the market is out there. The science might not be quite ready. It's too complex at this point in time. Um, the plant might think it's a bad idea. And that's usually an easy one, because you may never get a plant back. If it's going to ha harm the plant cell, the plant thinks it's a bit not a good idea, the plant will never regenerate. Then sometimes the plant is telling you something, and you need to pay attention to that. Uh, it, it may not survive tissue culture. It may be infertile. It may impact the phenotype, and 
it would never be acceptable to the grower and it may not perform properly. So there are lots of reasons along the way. It may not be inherited in a Mendelian fashion. It may not be stabilizable. And clearly you can't sell something that's going to have poor quality issues. Um, you could have yield drag. Now, you look back in the very early days, the original Roundup Ready trait had some yield drag, but the trait was so valuable to the grower that they were willing to accept a 5% loss. And that eventually was overcome by correcting germplasm or making new events. But in this day and age, if you didn't have no impact or an increase on yield, most likely the grower would not accept that. So there are lots of places along the way where things can screw up. Um, therefore, you should start big. Lots of ideas. See if you can get it to work, and then make lots of events to find the one that actually works the best. And um, Dr. Mum had a beautiful kind of a funnel picture is what we call it. This is a slightly different way of showing it. But you start with a whole bunch of ideas. Then you work it down to the single event. Now, there was a survey conducted by CropLife, the Philip Smith Google survey, and that's where these numbers come from. They surveyed many of the biotechnology providers to find out how many different, they call it mean units, were actually tested. This could be traits, this could be number of events, this could be just different uh, units, whichever is pertinent at each step along the way, to find out how are you actually going to get to the single event. And there it says two, because usually you pick one event plus one backup. In the early days, we had one event and we ran with it. No backups. You, you took the, the yucky with the good, and you were very happy to have that good at all. And then there's that key inflection point. And in the case of maize, once you have that one event, you're then going to introgress it, as Dr. Mum discussed, and put it into many different hybrid backgrounds. If you're working, however, with a crop, that's vegetatively propagated, you can't. You can't accomplish that into many different germplasm backgrounds. So instead, you have to start at the beginning and retransform into the different germplasm backgrounds that you might be interested in. And the way the regulatory systems work, every time you have a new event, you have to do a new safety assessment. So that is a lot of expense for each event. And that explains why companies tend to focus on the crops that have big acreage and that you can breed from instead of start all over again with new events. So this, this does take a while. And like I said, these are real numbers from a survey. OK, so what happens to the events that don't make it? Some never survive selection. Some never make it out of the greenhouse. Some do get to the field where you can compare how does the efficacy, do they perform properly, do they look normal. Only the best performers with the correct attributes get promoted. Okay, so this, this is the slide that I usually start out with at the beginning, but it, it seems more appropriate here, and I think you'll see it again later in the... Uh, I think Dr. Goodman has it in his presentation as well. I call this the bead slide. And the idea here is that this orange bead is the desired trait that you want to put into your new plant variety. And then the top half, in traditional plant breeding, you would cross it through sexual cross with your commercial variety and end up not only with the orange bead, but also with some of the other attributes that you might not want, some of the other genes. And then, as was described very nicely in previous talks, you have to go through continual rounds of breeding to remove that extra genetic information that is not desirable for your final product. That process is not subjected to regulatory oversight. You do not have to do safety assessments. And it's also not very precise. You're bringing in a lot of extra information that you may or may not want the critical point here is that it's only done through sexual crosses. In the case of biotechnology products, the bottom part, that donor organism where you're going to get that orange bead from can be anybody, anywhere. It's not necessary that it be sexually compatible with 
the commercial plant variety that you're trying to insert it into. You, start, you insert, however, only that gene into your new variety. And the bottom part is transgenic technology, and that's subject to a lot of regulatory oversight. These products have, are the most highly evaluated food crop that we consume. We know the most about this kind of information. And, and this is what I'm going to talk about a little bit further now. Okay, so how do we do a safety assessment? This is step two in the way I've divided up bringing a transgenic product to market. You've identified your lead event, and now you want to take it commercial. So we need to do a safety assessment. And it's a multi-pronged approach. We have to evaluate the safety of the gene and the protein as well as the crop. So we're going to look at attributes associated with the gene. Where did it come from? What does it look like? What does it encode? And then the protein that's produced. The protein is analogous to an active ingredient in, the most, in those cases. We also have to look at the crop characteristics and environmental safety. And then the point of this whole workshop is the food and feed composition. So this is where it fits into the whole overall process. The molecular characterization was actually described previously. We have to look at the number of DNA inserts and how stable is the insert over time. How many copies and the integrity. Do we get the whole, do we get the promoter, the coding region, and the terminator? Do we get any fragments? Hopefully not. Um, exactly we, what is in there. We need to define that. We look for the absence of the backbone of the, of the plasmid and confirm that it's not present. And we identify the insertion site and the sequence of the flanking um, genomic region on either side of where the new gene has inserted. And we do the sequence across the entire inserted DNA. And then there may be additional studies that are specific to that particular event or that might be done in response to questions from various regulatory agencies. Uh, for the protein characterization for food and feed safety, we have to characterize the protein that is expressed in the plant. Is the plant producing what we expected it to produce? We do um, a lot of safety studies with the protein, and because the expression level in the plant is usually so low that we have to produce the protein in a recombinant organism like E. coli or some other expression system. So if you use a protein from a, an expression system, we have to demonstrate that it's equivalent to what the plant is making. We saw a little bit of this yesterday in the, with the, the pea versus the bean situation. So that's where the equivalence for the protein comes from here. We have to measure how much protein is expressed in the plant, in which tissue, and throughout the growing season. This, this goes towards your safety margins when you're doing your toxicology studies. It also goes in, if your um, event is pesticidal, it goes towards the label that goes on the bag. You need to know how much of your pesticide is out there, what, what is going to be the maximum amount that's going to be in the field, just as if you're going to apply a chemical. So we purify gram quantities of proteins. Um, this, this can be a major challenge in the whole process to produce sufficient protein. And then sadly, what do you do with it? You, you stuff it down a mouse's throat, basically. But you characterize it, and then you show that it's safe. Proteins are generally safe. Um, it's a single class of chemistry that we know a lot about. It's required for us. We have to consume a certain amount of protein, or we cannot grow and live and sustain ourselves. Uh, so. Proteins are very different than xenobiotics. And that is something that I think gets lost in the mix a lot. And I could get off on that tangent, but I will rein myself back in right now. <laughs> uh, we also do uh, an allergenicity assessment and a toxicity assessment on these proteins. Um, we look at agronomic equivalence and environmental safety. So we do agronomy and phenotypic assessments. Does the corn look like corn, taste like corn, grow like corn, feel like corn? And most importantly, does it yield appropriately? Overall, 
if the plant performance would be impacted, the easiest way to see that, to visualize that, is through yield. Because that's kind of the overall arching um, element here. But we also look to days to flowering, plant height, stay green, all these kinds of things that are specific for, e for each crop and that are typical parameters that a breeder would be examining as they're developing new varieties. We look to make sure that there's no weediness. Now, uh, I was fascinated by several of the talks yesterday afternoon. They were talking about during domestication, um, how we've actually made crops dependent on humans in order to, for them to perform. And that, that's true. You don't usually see corn growing, you know, on the side of the road. It, it can't without a lot of inputs from humans. But we want to make sure that none of our transgenic crops have reverted to becoming more, more weedy. Uh, we also look at the environmental safety and the fate of, of the protein, the newly expressed protein, and the genes, and their impact on the environment. Impacts and interactions with target and non-target organisms. It's a little hard to have a non-target organism if you didn't have a target. But nevertheless, we look at the impact of uh, the whole ecosystem, the plant, and any of the insects or other organisms that may, may visit a field, as well as interactions with the abiotic environment and soil. Okay, so for environmental safety, this is a list of some of the organisms that ecotoxicological studies would be conducted with. Avian, usually um, mallard or quail. People generally pick quail because they're smaller. Um, fish, catfish, or trout, either one. We've done studies with both. Daphnia, um, earthworm, lady beetles, honeybees, lacewings, springtails. Uh, Lacewings and springtails are kind of interesting, neither one of which feed directly on the plant, both of which feed on organisms that feed on the plant. So we're looking, there's a special name for that, I can't remember, secondary? Anyway, so we look at many different aspects is the main point. Other non-target organisms, we look at the fate of the protein in the soil and also would have an insect resistance management plan. Okay, so I saved compositional analysis for last, and now I'm going to just focus on that. Uh, so we, we are concerned about composition and nutritional equivalence. Uh, these involve studies from multi-location, multi-year replicated field trials. We looked at the composition, both nutrient and anti-nutrient on analyses of grain and process fractions for confirmation of food and feed safety. And we also do whole, feed, whole um, food feeding studies with different animals. Uh, factors to consider are what analytes do we examine? How many lines to examine? What is the appropriate comparator? The null segregant, a parental line, reference varieties, how many, how many uh, varieties? And should we just be dependent on the crop composition databases that are available? How many years? How many locations? How many replicates? How to analyze the data? Um, one of my favorite quotes was from a, a former Canadian regulator, and, and he used to say, if you torture the data enough, it will confess. <laughs> so there are many different ways of doing statistical analysis. I have another joke about statistics, since that one was well received. <laughs> and that w this was from a statistician, and she said that variance is the number of statisticians in the same room. <laughs> so that was the best analysis that I have. Anyway, um, process fractions and then the trait. Do you do different analysis depending on whether it's an agronomic trait or an altered nutrition trait? So um, the compositional analysis for corn, I'm, and I'm going to give examples for corn and potato in the last five minutes that I have. Um, these are the kind of components that we may look at. How do you determine the analytes? The OECD has put together consensus documents, and Kathleen Jones is going to give a talk, um, I think, in the next section. And uh, she will tell 
a lot about how that information is arrived at. So that's one place to get the list of analytes. And so for potato, this would be another um, list of potential analytes. Now I wanted to get into some of the specific uh, real world examples. And those factors that I just mentioned may depend on what question you're trying to ask. And the data in, in this slide would be data that would not be part of the dossier. This would be done earlier. This is looking at multiple events, the same gene, the same location, same construct that was used to generate the events. And the idea, these are all in pairs, a plus and a minus, transgenic, non-transgenic, for seven different, seven different events. And the reason why this is not part of a dossier is because it's seven different events, and a dossier is only one event. What you can see here is that there's no consistent impact of the trait in these seven different events. And this is just looking at approximates. Uh, this would be more of what you would do in a dossier. And in this case, we're comparing the same event that's been crossed with different testers. This is corn, so this is different background. And again, what you can see just for proximates alone here is that the um, transgenic, and in this case that's P versus C for control, there's no, no difference between the composition uh, for each hybrid cross. But you can tell different hybrids have, have slightly different uh, components here. So uh, this was very impressive to me at the time when I first saw this kind of data. And this is a similar situation in which we're looking at key amino acids. Again, you can tell difference in the test across, but you can't tell uh, a consistent difference, plus or minus the transgene. Uh, this is a different situation. This is potato data in this case. And this is four different potato varieties, one of which is transgenic, planted at five different locations. And we're looking at minerals. And what you can see is that there's more impact, in this case, of the location on the composition. If you look at sodium, for instance, location one is vastly different than location two. But the difference between the potato varieties, whether it's transgenic or conventional, you can't tell. Um, in this case, this is also potatoes. These are different events, the same trait, but achieved by different contra the constructs actually done by different companies, but with the same trait at the end of the day. And in this case, the trait is altered starch. These are waxy potatoes, high amylopectin, low amylose. And uh, you can't see any difference of the impact of changing the, the way that this trait was introduced by using different approaches. OK, this is. Um, uh, basically my last slide, I believe. And in this case, we're looking at the impact of the altered trait. This, again, are the same potatoes. Different. It has high amylopectin starch. And in this case, we're focusing in on components that are closely related to starch synthesis, such as glucose, fructose, the sugars. Vitamin C is related, as are total glycoalkaloids. And you can see, again, where we're comparing the transgen transgenic with reference or parental varieties in the fact that there may be some trends, but not consistent. So um, it, I, would, I don't want to dwell on this, because this would take way, way too long. But if we have specific questions, we can, we can talk about this later. OK, so in summary. It's very important to start safety studies early. I think I neglected to mention this at the beginning. But there is a lot of work at the very beginning stages before you've introduced a trait into the crop to make sure you're not taking uh, a, a protein or gene that has um, homology to known allergens or known toxins. That's done even before you actually do any transformation. Uh, regulatory studies take two to three years way down the road. Studies are comprehensive and cover intended and unintended effects. Dossiers must include validated diagnostic tests specific for the event. Approval takes four years. Products have been shown to be safe as, food, safe as feed and good for the environment. 
I just wanted to emphasize that acceptance rate, as we sh saw earlier, is really high among growers and growing, and public, accept public acceptance is also growing. So thank you very much, and I'd be glad to answer any questions. Given the fact that um, tissue culture can introduce its own variability, uh, is it appropriate to even uh, do the composition analysis uh, with the parental line? Uh, because usually it's, you know, the line that you transform is not commercially uh, desirable. So at what stage is the best stage to do composition analysis? That's the basic question. So the comparison, uh, comparison study. Okay, uh, to repeat the question, um, the question was, is the parental line the best comparator? Because when you take tr um, go through the transformation, you take it through tissue culture, and you could introduce different changes just by taking a line through tissue culture. So it, it really depends on what is the question you're trying to ask. Are you trying to ask, has a transgene introduced uh, an altered composition as a result of having the transgene there. And in that case, most likely the best comparator would be a negative segregant. Uh, if you're trying to answer the question, have you altered the composition in comparison to a parental variety, then you have to use the parental variety to answer the question. If the question is, have you altered the composition relative to what is normally safely consumed, then you probably would most likely want to use a bunch of conventional varieties. So different regulatory agencies around the world have a different question that they're asking and place emphasis on different um, comparators. To me as a scientist, when I first got into this business, what I wanted to know was do you have the transgene in a, in a crop and the crop exactly the same without the transgene, are they different? But that's not necessarily the question that's currently considered the most important now, where they want to know a crop with the transgene versus any crop, same variety, <laughs> that's being consumed, is it any different? And that's a totally different question. Um, also, I think it depends on the crop, because uh, if, if you're working with potatoes, and there's it's only vegetatively propagated, and potatoes always go through a tissue culture stage, then you have to compare it to the parental variety, not worry or, or, or not be consumed by the fact that there might be some variation. If you're, on the other hand, working with something like corn, and you're going to be breeding it away, a negative segregant may be way, way down the line. A sibling, way down the line, might be the best comparator if you just want the plus and minus question answered.